So hello world, what is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. I'm super excited to welcome back our next guest to the show. You've seen him on Chelsea Lately and as host of the brilliant talk show, The Game Show. His book, My Life as a Goddess, dropped yesterday and is steeped so deeply in all things guy. It is funny, it is moving, it is so smart. I felt like an absolute idiot reading it at times. I came away having learned so much, not only about his journey, but uh, pop culture, gay culture, a shit ton about Canada. I wasn't expecting that. This book has it all, my friends. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the great Guy Branham right here. Let's make some noise for Guy. Good to be here. Matt, we need to talk about your shoes, okay? Let's, okay. Those are really exciting. I was like, oh, he's wearing little floral shoes. But no, it is Super Mario Brothers character. Yes, absolutely. Like, that's very exciting. Get it, getting that flash of ankle, the best part of a man's body. Yes. It's my, well, one of my most flattering features, I think. <laughs> it is my ankle, so I try to show it off. Yes. you got to know your strengths. It's a, gorgeous, it's a gorgeous picture. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to get a tight on that, right? We, that's why we have the jib. Yes. It is specifically to get the ankle shot. When shots. they were setting up the studio here, they were like, we might need a shot of someone's ankle. No, yeah, exactly. And I said, I, and I had a dream. I said, I could be that someone. <laughs> Uh, Guy, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thank you for having me It, it is so awesome to have you back. And congratulations, man. I, I've said it multiple times. I said it back there. I said it just a moment ago. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Thank I you really so much. Yeah. I always dreamed of uh, having to show America's bookshoppers my shoulder hair. And <laughs> now it's becoming a reality. Well, you know, dream it, be it, right? This is... <laughs> I, I do love the cover. I love everything about it. Honestly, you uh, you were just at, I want to say, the, the Grove last night. Is that true? Uh, were... Yeah, I, in L.A. I went to the Grove, where I actually have a story in my book yeah. about trying to seem smart to a cute boy at the Grove and failing miserably, <laughs> and I got to read it very close to the almost Starbucks that is in there. They have one of those weird things that says it's a Starbucks, but then won't take Starbucks gift cards, and that makes me very upset. <laughs> that's, that's almost like uh, Die Hard recently just did like a 50th anniversary screen like at the tower. Oh, That's kind of like your version of that. That is definitely my version of it. And then British people tried to take over the mall I was in, and I tried to fight them off, but I was too large to climb through the ducts. Uh, that's exactly what I read happened online. So, <laughs> so it sounds like the book tour is off to a great start. You're having a lot of fun going around talking about it. It's, it's been great so far. How are yeah, you doing with I'm, this whole I'm process? doing all right. I mean, it's a little bit weird. It's a book full of sort of uh, stories about me and also sort of like how I figured out how to tell story yeah. stories about somebody like me from like uh, other stories in pop culture. Um, and so it's been neat forcing people to learn about the stuff that I care about and pay attention to the boring things that I love too much. Well, that's just what I loved about this book is it isn't just, a, it is your story. We get your story, of course, but there's also just like uh, how the media children consume and packs them later in life and, and how in general pop culture portrays fat people as inherently uh, immoral and just all these different things. And like I said, I learned so much just about gay culture. There's so many pop culture touchstones that you weave into your story was that always the vision when you set out to write this book well it's very funny like i started out just tr like planning on writing the same book of like humorous stories from my childhood that every comedian is forced to write at some point in time it is a little bit like jury duty for our community um <laughs> but then there was you gotta write your your childhood diet. right you gotta do that there was an editor who i didn't end up working with um who uh listens to my podcast and she was like if you write a book where you don't talk about why you love ruth bader ginsburg in canada you're doing it wrong and i was like okay how do i tell my story but also force people to learn about canadian history at the same time yeah. i am not from canada <laughs> and you are probably like but why would a person who isn't from canada care in any way about canada and that is why i wrote the goddamn chapter okay <laughs> to challenge you and your presumptions about this world. It really, it, it was one of, uh, just one of the many moments that, that, that stick out when you come to the end of this book. Also, yeah, the three-page tangent about Ruth Bader Ginsburg that you use as a lens through which to explain why you still uh, can enjoy Eddie Murphy Delirious. <laughs> It's, it's unbelievable, the, these connections that you weave and the way that your brain is kind of wired. Uh, you know, I, well, I, what I wanted the book to feel like was I had had two and a half drinks in me at a cocktail party and it cornered you and were forcing you to listen to my opinions about something. Um, and like so many people in my real life have had to experience that. And now you can do it in the form of a book. And let me tell you, the book is less sweaty than I am in situations <laughs> like that. 
Um, talk to me about uh, the decision. How does one draw the parallel uh, between the, the unabridged uh, oral history of Canada and talking about your, your sister? How do you find these connections? Do these connections exist already in your head, or did you say, these are things I want to address, and here's where they kind of line up? Oh, it's very funny. There were some things in my head that I like knew that these unrelated things came together, but so frequently it was just in the course of writing, uh, I would be like, like in the middle of my chapter uh, about like going to clubs and learning about nightlife, um, I do have two very long footnotes about extinct species of weird mammals from Spain. And it is just, it was the most logical reference in my own head at the time. And if I were talking to any human being, I wouldn't force them to listen to that. But like, I'm like, this is my book. People are gonna have to hear my metaphors in that situation. Yeah. And like, uh, you know, my sister is a complex problematic person. I didn't know how to talk about her. And so I decided to talk about the opposite of her, yeah. the very cooperative and supportive nation of Canada. <laughs> well, that's just it. You always brilliantly like tie it back in at the end of the day. You said there was a, an editor you didn't work with who said that's how you should be writing. The editor you did work with, did you ever submit things and they're like, guy, just tell us what the hell happened. Like, <laughs> did they ever no, it's really wonderful because I like showed the book to my friends and they were like, you have to cut this, this is boring, or you're digressing too much. And I completely listened to my friends who told me that. But my editor was just like, this is hilarious, keep going. He was astoundingly supportive and I really w am worried about that. Wait, why are you worried about because that? Because I, I like, like what this is now? Because I work in television and like in television when you write something, somebody says, no, do it different, but like a thousand times. And my editor, Rakesh, but my, he's a really, really talented uh, novelist. He has two really good books, No One Can Pronounce My Name and Blue Boy. Uh, and maybe he has more book, but those are the two that I own. Um, <laughs> but he was just like, I, he was encouraging me to sort of like, bring people into my world and sometimes that involves like weird digressions yeah yeah um you know you talk about uh how that you kind of briefly compared it to being a writer for television you, you've done that. you've been in tons of writers rooms and we talk about in the book that you started writing essays and things of that nature for publications you still do to this day uh was that that thing you just described right there the biggest challenge of coming into this format of like not getting that feedback that you were so used to? Like it really was because like for a TV show or something else, I'm trying to fit somebody else's vision. Yeah. I am trying to work within sort of like the constraints of that structure. And here I could do anything. And so for such a long time, I didn't know what to do. Uh, and then finally, I was so far like behind my deadline that I was like, oh no, I really have to finish this book. And then it just came. It just started a flowing. How long did it take? What was the entire process front to back? Um, I mean, it, it was like over a year, but I would say eight, eight months of that was just writer's block and self-hatred. Just <laughs> me sitting, sitting at my desk and being like, I should go do some dishes and then doing nothing for the next three days. That's pretty amazing. So, wait, well, so what was that feeling when you walked into the bookstore and you saw it was done? It was a thing. There's a stack of them. What does that feel like? Um, it's exciting, but also a little bit ridiculous. This thing like, that seemed like a fun effort when I was just doing it at home or sharing it with like my agent and my editor yeah. seemed fine. And now it really is like... The thing that scares me most is that people are going to, like, about halfway through, hit that chapter about Canada and then be like, what am I doing? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why are you doing this? And I do also enjoy that in talking to journalists, like, you know, I, I talk about celebrities that I have worked with. I am very frank about my family. I am very frank about sexuality in ways. Uh, but the, the thing that journalists are, are the most frequent, like, I can't believe they let you do that, was... The chapter about Canadian the history. Canada chapter. I mean, I get why that comes up because, first of all, it's what makes the book refreshing and weird and different is because you don't see it coming. Yeah. And that's why everybody is like, what the hell is this chapter about Canada about? Exactly. But, uh, so that's like why, but also too, for me, it's like you're going to have one of two reactions. You're going to be like, what am I doing? Or you're going to be like, oh, he just doubled down. I'm in. Where does this go? Like, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is like, I figure... My stand-up, the writing I do for TV, all of that, like, I am sort of structuring that to be uh, as inviting as possible. And I want this to be a fun and enjoyable read, and I hope it is. Yeah. But it's also like, this is a home game. Yeah. You are playing on my turf. <laughs> We're going to talk about the things that I want to talk about. You write your book, and then I'll learn about your deal, okay? That's, that's how this works. Yes. Uh, you just mentioned, uh, you know, doing your stand-up, doing the shows, and this was eight months of 
writer's block, was there overlap? Were you also working on stand-up? Were you also working on other things? Did you find yourself having to compartmentalize, like, oh, I'm going to explore this in the book or I'm going to explore this on stage? Well, the weirdest thing was um, I wrote so much of it while we were doing the second round of Talk Show, the Game Show, um, and I was infinitely more productive when I was working 12 hours a day and then coming home and having to tap out some book as opposed to, like, when I just had all of my life to do it. And at that point in time, I really was just making coffee and doing the dishes all day long. <laughs> Which is uh, definitely a way to get stuff done, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, you know, and we talk so much about the Canada thing and, uh, and, and all the different things that you weave in there, but there is a vulnerability. You do open up uh, a lot about um, not just your story about coming out, but just post-coming out. And yeah. nobody ever talks really about that part of the process, or if they do, because I'm a boring straight guy, I haven't read it before. Well, no, but like it's like it is an embarrassing thing to talk about. I was fascinated like, by being it. being 23 years old and having to figure out the things that most people figure out when they are 13 year old girls. When you're a creepily gigantic man, <laughs> is hard. Like. Having a crush on a boy for the first time, you're never not going to be a 13-year-old girl. Uh, and there just isn't culture, there, you know, there are few, so few touchstones to go to to say, like, how do I get through this? And thank God I had a lot of people in my life who had been 13-year-old girls who were able to take me by the hand and say, this is going to be all right. Yeah. Now shut up just for a while. <laughs> Do you ever, because you also talk about the lack of uh, uh, representation in gay voices, especially in the, the stuff you were consuming as a kid and how that, uh, you know, there, when you found one, you latched onto it and you really learned to love it. Do you feel the weight of being one of those powerful voices now for a new generation? Well, I think things are changing a lot. Yeah. And, y you know, like when I was growing up, it was still illegal in a bunch of states to be gay. Gay people couldn't get married. And we definitely didn't tell stories from the perspective of gay people. Uh, and it is nice that we are all getting a whole lot more chilled out and able to sort of like explore these things. Last night I went and saw Head Over Heels, which is like fabulously gay and queer and trans and just sort of realizing that kids are gonna come to Broadway with their parents and go into this Go-Go's musical and like find just a couple of pieces of culture to help them understand themselves is, is very exciting. I am excited for all of the other voices in stand-up comedy, um, the people who are writing, who are, you know, writing honestly about what our what our experiences are like, because for such a long time we had to be really scared. And yeah, there have always been gay guys in the arts, but we were always writing for or through women or or straight men, and we were always having to sort of like, you know, perform a kind of ventriloquism. Or even uh, an example, like I was talking about in the green room, uh, Freddie Mercury at like Bohemian Rhapsody, so densely packed with metaphor and symbolism, and like. I was saying to you, this was one of those moments. I've been singing that song for years, and the the significance of that, of just the one line alone of pulled my trigger versus pulled the trigger, and and what that means, and how yeah. it opens up the whole door, it blew my mind, and it called everything into question. I started going back, but yeah, now as as art, that's artistic, that's fun, that's amazing. But you're right, there people are finally getting to just tell their stories through their lens. They don't have to sneak it into pop yeah. culture anymore. I mean, we all know that Freddie Mercury liked to mess around with dudes, and we all know all of these songs, but we never put those two things together and like like certainly um you know my reading of bohemian rhapsody doesn't have to be your reading of bohemian rhapsody but also do you have a reading of bohemian rhapsody <laughs> like i think a lot of us are not even thinking about what it might be about yeah that that's that was a really good point yeah, it was in the book it's like this is my reading it doesn't have to be yours but it's a damn good reading. <laughs> Thank saying, you. It's a very convincing reading. Thank I was you. like, I'm going to co-opt this reading. I really like this Thank reading. You. Um, you know, I'm I'm so excited. Uh, I love talk show, the game show. I'm such a big fan. You say you're working through on the second season. Uh, uh, how are things going with talk show, the game show? Has there been talk of more talk show, the game show? We're still not certain where things still are right now. We had the second run, and it was great. Uh, and I hope that True TV makes more. You and me both. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me ask you this. Uh, since in the second one, because I think I only talked to you for a little bit, uh, favorite guests, favorite moments, things of that nature, things that stand oh. out? Oh, I mean, in the first one of Talks to the Game Show, we had Tiffany Haddish on. Unbelievable. Like, after she had shot Girls Trip, but before people had seen Girls Trip and had, like, truly fallen in love with her. And Tiffany Haddish is one of those people who, like, is always fun and a good time to be around, but is also built for talk shows. I mean, like, uh, my producer Paige was like, my only worry is the version of the story she told me last night lasted 12 minutes. Can we cut this down to four? Um, but you know, That's when- a great problem to have. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, somebody like Tiffany, like, 
it's a stupid show with too many rules. And like Tiffany didn't know what any of the rules are and she scored more points than anyone had ever. Um, and that is, that makes me truly happy. Yeah, as it should. Um, you know, you, you mentioned briefly uh, that you really loved the Dick Van Dyke show when you were growing up. Yeah. I, too, was uh, inexplicably obsessed with the Dick Van Dyke show, uh, and I love Lucy and all of those old shows. And it's a thing you talk about, that kids are obsessed with the old shows. Do you see uh, new old shows as new generations are coming up? Are you finding them going back to the same old shows that we did? Um, it's interesting because... Um like, my niece obsessively watched all of M.A.S.H. over the course of, like, two summers ago, and she just recently started obsessively watching The Office. I was just talking to a woman who was saying her teenage daughters are going through all of Frasier, and I'm oh, like, love that. what could be a better education for children than watching, like, mid-'90s versions of French farce? Um, <laughs> they were be they're going to be very prepared for the world. They I, I love Frasier so much, I am scared of this reboot. I am deeply frightened of this reboot. Uh, is that Really, ha that's not really happening. No, there's talk of a Frasier reboot. The thing that I heard, and it doesn't make any sense, where they would throw everything out the window except Kelsey Grammer. Oh, that's what I heard. It's no, not a podcast. You Nothing you hear on a podcast. You can't is real. do that. Exactly. You need David Hyde Pierce. That's what I'm saying. Who wants to watch it without Niles? Yes. Um, uh, I recently did the podcast Love It or Leave It. John Lovett had a pitch for his version of Frasier. I would encourage you to go and listen to that okay. because it's very strong. I still don't believe in it. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm getting. I'm gonna say that we've got some questions in the audience. Uh, okay. I could talk to you about Frasier reboots all day, but let's <laughs> let's keep our word here. We got some microphones in the room. First question looks like it's coming right here. Hi. Um, I was just curious about like situations you've had uh, with the Daily Californian, I believe. Yes. And um, the whole situation with Chelsea Clinton. And I was just wondering if that you could speak to um, how your comedy has like evolved as you like age and like through your career. Uh, what a great and weird question. He is asking me about a thing that happened 20 years ago. I am very old. When I was in college, <laughs> I, I went to Berkeley at the same time Chelsea Clinton was at Stanford, and I had I like wrote a column for my campus paper, and um, I it was like our big game, and so I was writing about Stanford, and I said that they were like all fancy, and Berkeley was all like poor kids, and so we needed to tear apart their school. And one of the things I said was, Chelsea Clinton represents the Stanford ethos of establishment worship, which must be subverted and destroyed. And then it was quoted in, by the Associated Press as, Chelsea Clinton dot 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 must be destroyed. <laughs> so then the Secret Service came to my house. Um, but I love the way you phrased that question because it really is about evolution. When I was a 22-year-old from like a little farm town who felt very much like I did not have power in this world, I really thought that the one power I had was to tear at the people who had power or who had connections who were able to have things a little bit more handed to themselves. And I think that's a rage that we all know. Um, but part of me growing up has been understanding that like rage is not enough. Look, rage has powered me in so many ways through so many parts of my life. But just sort of understanding like, hey, before you tear at somebody, maybe step back and think about their experience. Like a lot of people who it seems like have great lives um, also have complexities. And so don't necessarily do that. But also keep them claws, girl, keep them claws. <laughs> That was great. Thank you for that question. That story in the book, uh, and it's fantastic. Thanks. Well, yeah, it's it, like I said, we do it's not get my your best story. moment. No, it's but not. I tried to have stuff in the book that wasn't my best moment. Yeah, no, you totally, you totally achieved that goal for sure. What I got? I got one more. All right, let's see. We got one more. Uh, come on down. Hi. Um, so I was wondering. Um, you talked a lot about your inspirations um, for your comedy. So I'm wondering um, what recommendations do you have for rising comedians and writers um, that like inspired you or just any advice? Oh, what a great question. Um, there are like tons of really good comics who are working right now who you should know more about. Um, Joel Kim Booster and Solomon Giorgio both had uh, Comedy Central Presents last year, and they are both super, super great. Uh, Riley Jess Silverman is a really funny comic um, who is delightful and nerdy um, and the best. Um, and when it comes to writers, uh, there was a book that just came out called uh, I Can't Marry Jesus by this guy named Michael Arsenault that is super, super funny, super, super pop culture -y. And if you, you know, I, I, a lot of people who are buying my book are also getting that, so you might like that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Those are great. <laughs>
Uh, guys, thank you so much for your questions. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Fantastic. Uh, Guy, congratulations again. I can't say it enough, man. Thanks a hell so much. of a book. Thanks for having me and back. It's so great to have you back on the show. And you set such a shoe game. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. That does. You've made my entire day. Uh, well, if I ever come back, they have to be better shoes next we're time. We're going to have to up the game. I don't yeah. know how. We'll figure it out. Uh, it's in stores right now. Oh, is there an audio book? Did you do There is an audio book. I recorded it, and Mindy Kaling did the foreword. She was nice enough to do that uh, on a very busy schedule. You guys took time away from Ocean's 8 to read for my book. So respect. That's real friendship right there. Yes. Everybody, my life is a goddess. Get it? Check it out. It's amazing. Guy Branham right here, please.